Hi, and welcome to this mind map lesson where we're going to run through everything to do with module 5.6 on photosynthesis from the OCR A-level biology syllabus. So the first thing you need to do uh, is to either take a screen grab of this picture right here, I'll disappear for a second, and if you can, print that out in A3. Uh, we're then going to annotate all these diagrams, draw around it to kind of um, sum up everything to do with photosynthesis. If you can't print in A3, that's fine. What you could do is take a picture of this uh, image right here. Again, I'll disappear for a second. And then you can cut these out um, and kind of stick them around your exercise book to make an A3 mind map using these images. Okay, let's get into the mind map without further delay. Okay, we're going to start right in the middle with an overview of photosynthesis. So the photosynthesis is split into two different parts, the light-dependent reactions and the uh, light-independent reactions. So the light-dependent reactions, well, first of all, everything takes place in the chloroplast. So let's label this chloroplast. And that's a little large, I forgot the size. There we go, okay. Right, so the light-dependent reactions need just one thing, water. And light-dependent reactions produce a waste product, oxygen, which is useful for us because we need to breathe that. Now, the light-dependent reactions also produce some other stuff. They produce two, two products, and they are ATP, kind of energy, plus, um, I'll write it here, reduced... NAD P. Now you can view that reduced NAD P as kind of a, it's a source of hydrogen. It, and NAD P is a coenzyme that's carrying hydrogen. So that hydrogen comes from the water actually. The water is split into hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is released, hydrogen's channeled this way. All right, well, what about the light independent reactions? <clears throat> well, the light independent reactions, they need carbon dioxide from the uh, from outside the chloroplast diffuses in CO2 and they produce glucose and that glucose can then be stored as starch can be respired can be passed to other organelles in the cell because remember this is the chloroplast or to other plant cells. Um, and to kind of close the loop, uh, waste products are produced, which is ADP plus PI. So that phosphate is cut off of ADP, um, sorry, ATP, three phosphates. We remove one, takes us down to ADP, <laughs> sorry, two phosphates. Um, and also, plus oxidized NADP. I'll just write ox for short there, oxidized NADP. So the hydrogens have been removed um, and used up in the light independent reactions. And we can see there's a cycle going on here in the middle. Okay, so that's the overview. Um, let's also, what should we do? Let's highlight the, um, The, the products in one color, and let's highlight the reactants in another color. Okay, so overall, the equation that we're familiar with, uh, let's write that as well, why not? Uh, that is H2O plus CO2 goes to C6H12O6 plus O2. Now you can see that that's not balanced. Let me zoom in a bit. So let's balance it. We're going to have to have six carbon dioxide molecules and six molecules of water. They will all combine together to produce the one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen will be released. Okay, what else? Okay, let's do a little, uh, little bit extra here. So glucose, um, can be respired, can be stored, 
uh, and that's probably a starch. And it also can be uh, converted into amino acids, that's alpha-alpha, that's the shorthand for amino acids, or lipids. Remember, if it's going to be converted to, into amino acids, we need, um, we need a source of nitrogen. So nitrates are used. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about... Well, first of all, let's talk about the structure of the chloroplast, actually, okay? Before we talk about the reactions in detail, let's go to the structure of the chloroplast. So over here, <clears throat> I have a diagram of chloroplast. The chloroplast is an organelle. Um, uh, so it's organelle. And it is around about a, mic a micrometer in size. No, it's a bit long, sorry, it's a bit longer than that. Two to ten, two to ten micrometers, that's quite long. So organelle, um, two to ten micrometers long. So it's bigger than a mitochondria, which is around about one micrometer. So bigger than a mitochondria. And remember, we think um, that it used to be its own free-living bacteria. So we, we're going to just reference this endosymbiotic theory. And that theory is that it used to be an, its own free-swimming bacteria, and then it got taken in by a cell and kind of became almost like domesticated. What I mean is it kind of became tame, almost, um, living inside the cell, doing jobs for the cell. Uh, and the, reason, the two key parts of uh, evidence, well, actually three, uh, we've got double membrane, We've got DNA and I'm going to put over here plus um, ribosomes, and those ribosomes are what's called 70s ribosomes, which means that they're sort of bacterial in style. They're bacterial style ribosomes. Okay. Now let's actually label this thing, which is what I was going to do. Okay, so first of all, we got the external membrane or the outer membrane. And then we've got the inner membrane. I just wrote mem there for short. Inner membrane here. Um, and together we call that a chloroplast envelope. And in between those two um, membranes, we have the intermembrane compartment or uh, intermembrane space. Let me just get rid of that actually. Let me put it somewhere slightly different. There we go. Put it here. Um, that's all the kind of the external structure. These parts are kind of slightly more important it's where the chemical reactions happen so i'm going to change color to kind of more, more key we've got the stroma um here we've got thylakoids which is a mem a system of membranes and, and this uh oh this is the sorry this is the thylakoids Sorry. And the thylakoids um, stack together in what is called a granum. So the granum is like a big stack of the membranes. Um, so I'll just kind of draw that here. The whole thing is the granum, but the thylakoid is like one thylakoid, two thylakoids, three, four, five, six, etc. Uh, and I think you can have like a hundred thylakoids in a granum. They can they can be really 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 stacked up. Yeah, that's right. Up to a hundred thylakoids can be in a granum. <clears throat> um, other things to label here between the thylakoids. That's the, this 
sorry, between the granum, there's a granum, there's a granum. These little bits here are called intergranal lamellae. Um, and that's also the same as this. And then right here, we this is just a, a gran another labeling of a thylakoid. You can call it a granal thylakoid. So basically the thylakoid membranes can be in two parts. The vast majority are in the granum. We call those the granal, granal thylakoids. Also, you can have a thylakoid membrane joining two grana, in which case you call it an intergranal lamellae. <clears throat> okay, so very brief notes on what happens where. Um, let's actually put that back on our diagram down here. So, um, color, color, color. Uh, purple. All right, so the light-dependent reactions happen in the thylakoids, and the light-independent reactions happen in the stroma. Okay, I'm gonna write that over here. I wanna try and write sideways, but I haven't yet figured out how to do that on my pad. It's a bit, a bit baffling to me. So I'm gonna do it like this. So uh, this, I'll write it vertical stroma, which is where the light independent reactions happen and the light dependent reactions happen in the grana at the thylakoid membranes. Okay, so we have a separation in space of where um, those two reactions happen. Other things, other parts about, so we've got DNA, we've got ribosomes, what else? Um, there are also lipid droplets as well in there. Um, we won't know, and starch grains um, as well. I'll just put in the stroma. Also, lipid droplets plus starch grains. Okay, well, what features, why is this a good structure? Um, well, first of all, let's, um, so let's write a little sub thing down here. Um, structural adaptations. Yeah, you've got an extremely high surface area of uh, thylakoid membranes. SA for surface area, high surface area of thylakoid. And the thylakoids are, are where the light independent uh, reactions take place. High surface area of thylakoids and, you know, we can say densely packed this is the thylakoid membranes with photosystems. And I'm going to put that down here because this is a photosystem. The other um, key feature is that the products of the light dependent reaction um, just immediately float off into the stroma where they are then used. So um, this kind of tight coupling between the thylakoids, which makes stuff, it diffuses into the stroma, then it's immediately used up. Um, so I'll just put stroma surrounds thylakoids. Yeah, <clears throat> more on that uh, with this diagram over here. All right, so now let's talk about the light dependent reactions um, and all of you know, we're going to talk about that quite a bit because it's quite a, it's quite a big deal. Um, let's bring this marker. No, that's too big. Oh no. <clears throat> Light. Is all of this left hand side. 
Okay, so the, key, the thing that carries out the absorption of light is called a photosystem. And what is a photosystem? Well, it's a protein in the membrane. And it's very large and very complicated, and it has a lot of pigments, which are prosthetic groups, bound in the protein. It's a really large and complicated protein. Um, and it, yeah, we'll just write, it contains different types of pigments. Uh, protein and membrane, let's just write large. Sometimes it's called an antenna complex. In actual fact, here's an actual um, structure of a photosystem. I'll show you how big it is. Here it is right here. Massive. Um, and it contains two different types of pigments. It contains, number one, accessory pigments. And then it contains a very special pigment which is called the reaction center pigment. Now the reaction center pigment is always a molecule of chlorophyll A, which we write CHLA. Um, and that chlorophyll A it can come in two ever so slightly different kind of um, types can either be P700 or P680. Uh, and then the this rest of this orange cone is the photosystem itself. And here we can see, I'm not sure if you've got it here, this is the light coming in. So let's just change make that a little more yellow. Light coming in. can be caught by um, pigment molecules. Now, little, going a little bit advanced, just a teeny bit more um, beyond the A-level syllabus, this white, these white arrows here show what's called energy transfer. And if you really want to give it a proper name, it's called resonance energy transfer. You don't need to know that term, it's beyond the syllabus. But it basically just means that energy, when it's been caught by one pigment molecule, a photon of light caught by one pigment molecule, the energy from that photon can be passed to the next um, chloro or next pigment molecule without any losses of energy. Okay, so it's very efficient, um, the passing on of energy. So why have all these pigments? Well, first of all, this, this word, antenna complex, is pretty good because um, increases the area over which photons can be harvested. So a photon can hit over here, and it can hit over here, and they can still be caught and funneled down to the reaction center. I have been using this word photons Hopefully you know it. Uh, photon is a particle of light. Okay, um, light can be kind of considered as as particles in this instance. It can also be considered a wave, but in this instance, we're thinking of it in terms of little packets of light energy, and that's what a photon is. It's a packet of light energy. Now, what else about the accessory pigments? So, first of all, because they're arranged in this antenna complex, they can increase the area, but also um, we can catch more light. Uh, whoops. All right. I don't know. Zoom in a little. We can catch a greater range of wavelengths of light. So let me zoom in a bit more on this diagram here, which is, I've 
put pretty small because you don't need to like know this diagram, but it's more for illust illustrative purposes. So what do I need to talk about? So P700 or 680 refers to wavelength. So that means that if you only had the reaction center pigment molecule, then the chlorophyll, the, the photosystem, would only be able to catch photons of light if they were coming in pretty much at bang on P700 or P680 nanometers in wavelength, which is a kind of um, infrared uh, wavelength. No, sorry, it's a kind of a red wavelength of light. Um, now, that would not be very good because you'd be missing out on all the other types of light. If you was only catching red, you'd be missing out on blues and, uh, and violets uh, and other slightly other shades of red and all that sort of stuff. So the accessory pigments can all catch slightly different wavelengths of light. So here they are in this graph. And you, are, you do need to know the names of some of them, but not necessarily exactly where they absorb. So it's going to be a bit of a squeeze for me to write them in, but I'll try. So we've got chlorophyll B is one of them. Uh, chlorophyll A, that's the actual primary one, which we've already talked about, this one. And then we've also got xanthophyll. That's why, xanthophyll. We've also got carotene. Uh, is that it? And there's other ones called pheophytin as well. Um, I'll just write it over here, plus pheophyton. So you can see that each one has a different peak, which means each one absorbs best at a different wavelength. For example, xanthophyll, if you read off the graph, that's this blue one here. If you go down from the peak, it is absorbing well at about 450. So when you kind of add up the, the, pig, the light that all those pigments can catch, it equals more. So in overall, and you don't need to put this on the graph, but you can if you want, overall, the kind of total um, <clears throat> kind of shape of the curve photosynthesis is a bit like this, which I'm putting in yellow. So the yellow represents kind of all the wavelengths of light kind of summed together. Okay, so that means that plants can use a lot of light in the blue area, a lot of light in the red area, but they don't really use much in the green uh, green area, which is why plants are green. They reflect the green light. How do we know about all this, all these different pigment molecules? Well, we can separate by chromatography, so that's what this shows down here. Uh, and let's give it its proper term, thin, oops, Thin layer chromatography, TLC chromatography. Remember that the RF value equals uh, distance of the spot over distance of the solvent front. Uh, and different, uh, different pigments will have different RF values. So how do you set that up? Uh, you've, got your, this, you've got your solvent down here. You put your spot of uh, sort of chloroplast extract. I'm going to put this to the side here because I don't think I'm going to be able to put it there. So you kind of, or your leaf extract. That's how do you do that? So you basically grind leaf, uh, pestle and mortar, normally in a solvent such as acetone. <clears throat> and you get this green liquid and then you kind of dab it on the spot with a capillary tube often. Remember that the, the line at the bottom, this line, has got to be a pencil line. 
Okay, if it is pen, the ink's going to run. It's going to mess everything up. And then up this bit here, that's the solvent front. Okay, so just a quick recap on chromatography. This bit down here is just what I already wrote over there. <clears throat> okay, all right, so that's kind of the structure of the chloroplast and stuff about the photosystems, which remember are proteins embedded in the thylakoid membranes. Right. Mm, edit. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the light dependent reaction. And there's two ways of viewing that light dependent reaction. Um, so the first way, the diagram is sometimes called the Z scheme. And it basically shows um, the energy level of electrons. Now, the second way of viewing that is actually looking at the membranes and sort of looking at, looking at it physically, not in terms of energy. So this is the Z scheme, which shows the energy levels. And this is um, looking at the thylakoids physically and where the chemical reactions are happening. So it gets a little bit complex. So I'm going to take you to uh, an animation to, first of all, look at the Z scheme down here and then we're going to label it okay so let's go to that animation okay so the first thing that happens is photons of light energy are harnessed by that network of accessory pigments and the energy is passed on down to the reaction center chlorophyll at the reaction center chlorophyll here that energy is used to excite electrons and the electrons are excited so much that they leave photosystem 2 they leave the chlorophyll a molecule and they get passed on to another molecule called an electron acceptor. Now, this remember, the height of this diagram is uh, referencing the energy of the electrons. So the, energy, the electrons now have a load of energy. Those electrons, they can flow down something called the electron transport chain, which is ETC. They move from acceptor to acceptor to acceptor, each time losing a little bit of energy. And that lost energy is used to phosphorylate ADP. So it's used to make ATP. The electrons end up just here at photosystem one. And what's happening there at photosystem one is pretty much the same thing that happened at photosystem two. Photons of light um, excite electrons in photosystem one so much that they leave. And they're replaced by the ones that come this way. So the electrons now from photosystem one are given even more energy than they had when they were excited over here. And now they've got so much energy that they can be passed on to the final electron acceptor molecule, which is NADP. And when it accepts those electrons, it is reduced to form reduced NADP, sometimes called NADPH. So the overall process uh, is called cyclic photophosphorylation. Now, sometimes the process can um, occur in a slightly different way. So sometimes we can get something called cyclic photophosphorylation. So you'll notice here that there is no photosystem 2 that would have been down here. And in cyclic photophosphorylation, we just have the electrons going up to the electron acceptor above photosystem 1. But then they're passed back down the electron transport chain this way, again, phosphorylating ADP to make ATP, and the electrons will just go sort of round and round and round in a cycle, hence cyclic. The other part of the puzzle that we haven't looked at yet is photolysis, which is the splitting of water, and this occurs only at photosystem 2 in a specific part of it called the oxygen evolving complex. And basically what's happening is light energy is used to split water, to rip the molecule apart. And from a water molecule, we can make two protons, two electrons, and half of a molecule of oxygen gas. So if we were to balance the equation, we need two molecules of water uh, to produce one molecule of oxygen gas. OK, now let's get back to the mind map and label all that stuff. So here we are. 
I'll zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, here we go. All right, so first thing, red refers to the energy level of the electrons. And then let's look at the, uh, the key down below. So this kind of orange uh, stuff here refers to photons of light. Light photon absorption, we could call it, to make it really clear. Um, the solid purple line is um, what's called non-cyclic photophosphorylation, photophosphorylation. Say the word, non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And the dotted line is cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay. All right, now let's look at um, the steps of that process. So <clears throat> the first thing is PS2 absorbs a photon of light and the reaction center chlorophyll molecule there is called P680, which means it absorbs best at, P at 680 nanometers of light. But remember, we've got accessory pigments catching extra bits of light either side of that wavelength peak and funneling it to the reaction center. Now, two electrons um, then get excited. So the two electrons leave the molecule and are passed onto a, an electron acceptor. Let's write that here. And then they're passed down this here, which we should label, I think we should label it the electron transport chain. I'm going to try and fit that here. Electron transport chain. Um, and they lose energy. As they lose energy, we make ATP. Let me put this in here. You can think of this as a bit like a water wheel. Here's a picture of a water wheel. And as the electrons kind of lose energy, just like water loses energy as it goes from a high level at the top of the water wheel to a lower level at the bottom, it's used to do work. So ATP is made. Um, more light energy is absorbed um, at photosystem two, sorry, photosystem one, my bad, photosystem one. This is PS1. And this is P700 wavelength. And two electrons, again, leave the chlorophyll A molecule in photosystem one and get excited and end up up here. And those two electrons that are lost are replaced by the ones that come down here. So there's a quick trade. These ones get excited and it's replaced by the ones coming in. <clears throat> and now they've got even more energy, so much that they can then be passed on to a special enzyme called um, NAB, NADP reductase. And I'll just make this even clearer. So it basically, it takes two electrons from here. It also takes in, um, it's green. It also takes in two NADP And it produces, and it takes in two hydrogen ions. Which are produced over here. And it forms the product reduced NADP. So in terms of key molecules that are produced from this process, reduced NADP is a product that is produced. ATP is a product that is produced by this process. Notice, if I just zoom over here, that those things are here, ATP and reduced NADP. Now, AD, ATP can also be produced, there's barely enough room to write it. If it's uh, cyclic, we can still produce ATP. So this, this arrow here just shows you that you can still produce ATP if you go the cyclic route. Now, the one thing I didn't talk about here was photolysis of water. Let's just label that. <clears throat> uh, 
And this is going a little bit beyond the syllabus here, but this little extra blue thing down here is called the OEC, the Oxygen Evolving Complex, and it's a special enzyme um, that can split water. And actually what happens is, to go even further, is when two electrons are excited and leave uh, photosystem 2, that photosystem 2 takes electrons from the ox oxygen evolving complex. And actually that happens again. So it then takes another two electrons from the oxygen evolving complex. So when the OEC has got a charge of um, 4 plus, what happens is two molecules of water come along and are split into four H plus ions plus oxygen gas. And that oxygen gas is a waste product. Um, and we breathe it in. It's released by the plants when we breathe it in. The, the hydrogen ions, they end up being used um, by the enzyme NADP reductase and stuck on to reduce NADP. Okay? Reduce NADP, by the way, this is a little bit going extra detail. It's easiest just to call it reduced NADP because in different textbooks it's written different ways. Sometimes you'll see it written as NADPH. Sometimes you'll see it written as NADPH2. Uh, and even sometimes it might be written as NADPH plus H plus, all like in a box like that. All of that is, just be aware of that. There, it, it, it basically, it's chemistry, and it's kind of difficult to really say exactly what it is. It involves something called a dative covalent bond, if you do do, do chemistry. Um, but it carries two hydrogen ions with it, basically. Okay, that's the key thing. It carries two hydrogen ions. All right, okay, so that's the Z scheme, um, which is about the energy levels. But let's actually look at um, where it happens in the thylakoid. Oh, actually, one more thing I just wanted to add. Um, we should m maybe just talk about the difference between cyclic and non-cyclic. Um, so maybe uh, we could put a little table. Cyclic, non-cyclic. Um, photo, photo system. Um, and then we should have uh, products. So cyclic photosystem is only PS1. Non-cyclic is PS2 and PS1. Products of cyclic photophosphorylation is only ATP. And the products of non-cyclic photophos photophosphorylation is ATP and reduced NADP. Um, we could also talk about where the electrons end up if you wanted to. If you're using the textbook there, you can see the table on page 121. Uh, and where the en electrons end up in cyclic, they don't really end up anywhere because they just go round and round and round. And the fate of electrons in non-cyclic is the electrons end up in the molecule reduced NADP. Uh, and the other thing is, does photolysis occur? Does the splitting of water occur? It only occurs with non-cyclic. Um, it doesn't occur with cyclic. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, how that light-dependent works in terms of thylakoids. We're going to look at this diagram up here, but I'm going to now take you to one more animation showing you kind of where physically these reactions are occurring. Um, and it's on YouTube. I'll show you the part that's relevant for us. I'll also link it in the description underneath. If you want to watch the full video, it's a great one. I really recommend it. It also takes you through some of the light independent stuff. So here we go. Um, here it is. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space <clears throat> called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems, called photosystem 1 
and Photosystem 2 that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem 2 first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While and this oxygen gas is a byproduct of hydrogen photosynthesis, ions. it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein <clears throat> called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, low energy electrons are re energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP to NADPH. <clears throat> so here we can see the whole thing going on. So notice the protons being pumped into the thylakoid space. So also notice that if I just click back there, you can see the formation of protons going on right there. When, when a water molecule split, we get more protons being formed as well as protons being pumped. So we really generate a gradient. Right, now we're going to look at uh, the mind map and, and label it as well. Okay, <clears throat> zooming in. All right, let's first of all kind of um, show the uh, the color scheme. I don't like having light as as purple. I like it as yellow. So I'm gonna get. I'm gonna put. Well, maybe you can't really see that yellow. Probably let's make it as orange. Okay, so I'm gonna make this light coming in here, and it's coming in here, and it's also coming in down here because the thylakoid membrane is kind of a pancake style, um, and inside we have what's called the thylakoid space. So let's label that. This is the thylakoid space. And in here, we've got H2O being split into a half O2. You have to zoom in even more. A half O2 plus 2H plus. Sorry, I was labeling, wasn't I? So these red molecules here are electron carriers. Red is the movement of electrons. I'll just write electrons. Blue is the movement of protons moving. <clears throat> this up here is the oxygen evolving complex, which we talked about earlier, uh, which is to do with photolysis. Light green is PS1, uh, which is P680. Sorry, no, P700, my bad, P700. And dark green is PS2, P680. Okay, let's label the rest of this here. Okay, so <clears throat> over here, we've got an um, integranal thylakoid. 
but most of the light dependent reaction occurs on the granal thylakoid, the core part of the granum. So this, this is a grana, granum, sorry, singular, grana is plural. And then we zoom in and we look at this, this big bit of the grana here. So I can just write zoom. So we've got hydrogen ions that are pumped into the intermembrane space by the action of the electron carriers. Just wanted to add a little bit more to this electron carriers. The electron carriers, they are generally proteins. They're in the membrane. And they often contain iron, Fe2+, because Fe2+, can be converted backwards and forwards to Fe3+. So, um, the proteins can accept electrons being reduced to Fe2+, and then can give them back again, being oxidized to Fe3+, <clears throat> um, which means they can pass on the electrons. So what happens here, light is absorbed, the electrons get passed through the electron carriers, the energy is used to pump protons. So we've got two extra protons here as the two electrons get passed along, that's the red arrow. Um, two extra protons, but also because of the splitting of water, we've got another two extra protons. So kind of the net gain down here is four extra protons. So that's pretty cool. I'll just write that here. 4H plus is the kind of net gain. Um, but over here on the other side in the stroma, well, we've lost these two um, protons from that side. So we've minus two. And also we even take in um, protons here. So protons get taken in on this side, another minus two. So in this side, we've kind of got minus four H plus. Um, and those protons are used to produce reduced NADP. And ATP, well ATP is made. So we have, um, a gradient, a big gradient. We've got four hydrogen ions taken away from this side, and we've got four hydrogen ions added in to this side. So that means that we have a huge, huge gradient. And I have forgotten to look up the pHs. Pause for one second. So I found those. So that means this gradient is so big that the pH in here is around about pH six, and the pH out here is about pH eight. Now, this is not in the syllabus, you don't need to know this, but if you do chemistry, you'll know that that is a hundredfold difference in a hydrogen ion concentrations. And that concentration gradient then can drive uh, ATP synthase. So hydrogen ions flow down their concentration gradient. I'm gonna use the pen color that we've got in the diagram here. So hydrogen ions flow down ATP synthase. And as they flow down the core of it, the whole thing spins. Um, and as it spins, it produces ATP. This process, this use of ADP synthase and the hydrogen ion gradient is called chemiosmosis. And it basically means using H plus gradient to um, <clears throat> spin ATP synthase and make ATP, okay? So that is physically where this is occurring. All right, so we've done quite a lot. We've done all the light dependent stuff, and now we're gonna look at the light independent stuff. Um, if you need to take a break, get a cup of tea, now might be a good spot, but I reckon we could probably get the rest done in about 20 minutes or so. Right, let's do it. So light, Independent. Is mainly this side. Now we don't call it the dark stage. We sometimes in some old books, you'll see it called the dark um, stage, but we don't really call it that because it, uh, it happens in the light uh, um, and it does actually need products of the light dependent reaction to proceed. It can't proceed very much in the dark at all um, because these things that it needs, ATP and reduced NADP, they quickly run out. 
So let's have a look at it. And this part, this the main pathway of the light independent reaction is called the Calvin, oops, Calvin cycle. Uh, let me just make that a bit smaller. Okay, yeah, Calvin cycle. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit and take you through the steps of the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide, takes in carbon dioxide. Now it's helpful to count the number of carbons that we've got in each of our molecules. So carbon dioxide, it's just got one carbon in it, okay, one C. Now Rubisco is an enzyme. Oops, hang on a minute. Um, that catalyzes the formation of, very, very briefly, there's a six carbon uh, intermediate. Hang on a minute. Pen's gone weird. Okay, very briefly, there's a six carbon intermediate, but then it quickly breaks down into two times three GP. Sorry, two times GP. Now, GP is a three carbon molecule. So also, sometimes I find it helps if I actually kind of draw these molecules. So we've got, just view it as a three carbon molecule, and we've got times two of them. Okay, so there's each black blob represents a carbon molecule. We've got um, three of them there. Carbon dioxide is, a, is a, just a one carbon molecule. So we've, um, and over here, we've got RUBP, which is, stands for ribulose bisphosphate. Now, ribulose bisphosphate, as you might have figured out using a bit of maths, is a five carbon molecule. So one, two, three, four, five. So what we've done is we've added one carbon to a five carbon molecule, made it briefly into a six carbon thing, which then breaks apart into two three carbon things. So all of that so far has just been using carbon dioxide and no energy has been needed. But now in comes energy, okay? Energy in the form of ATP. So, whoops, that's too large. That's better, okay, right. So in comes energy, two ATP is hydrolyzed into two ADP. Uh, plus PI. Okay, so energy is needed to drive the next stage of the reaction from GP to this product here. And also, something else is also needed, which is uh, reduced NADP. Change color. Two times reduced NADP is used up and oxidized NADP is produced. We could just call that 2NADP, but it's been oxidized. The hydrogen ions, sorry, the hydrogen atoms and electrons have been removed from the reduced NADP and used up. And the end result is still a three carbon molecule, but it's, it's a bit of a fancier molecule. It's called triose phosphate. Or TP. Now here's where it gets a little bit complicated. Some of that triose phosphate is taken away to make glucose. Now glucose is, is a six carbon molecule. Let me just move down a little bit. So let's actually draw that. Now we know that glucose actually can form a, a ring but I'll just keep it as six blobs for the moment. Okay, so that's um, 
six carbon. Now, actually, I forgot to put on the carbons for each one. So two times GP. GP is a three carbon molecule. These ones here, each triose phosphate is a three carbon molecule, and this is a six carbon molecule. So some of the triose phosphate is taken off to make glucose, and some of it is, um, this is the same thing here, triose phosphate, some of it is reconverted back into the original ribulose bisphosphate. Um, and in this case, ATP is, is needed and ADP is produced. And the extra phosphate actually, I think, gets stuck back to the molecule because this bisphosphate means it has two phosphates. So this is triose phosphate and this is ribulose bisphosphate. So hence, um, a phosphate has been kind of taken away from ATP and stuck on the molecule. Now, ribulose bisphosphate is a five carbon molecule, like so. Now, in order to get the numbers to balance, to, to really figure out what's going on in the cycle, we need to times everything by six, okay? Stay with me. So, in actual fact, we take in six carbon dioxides and we join them to six molecules of RUBP. So six RUBPs, six times five carbons, that would be 30 carbons, plus the six here, that would give us 36. I'll write these in brackets, so this is 30 carbons, and over here, now we've got the 36 carbon atoms, okay? You with me? 36 carbon atoms. Then we break them down into triose phosphate, um, and sorry, I forgot to say that here we've got 12 of these, because if we're timesing that by six, 12 times, six times two is 12, so we've got 12 molecules of glycerate free phosphate, or 36, we've got 12 molecules of triose phosphate, which is again 36 carbons. Now, out of those 12 molecules of triose phosphate, two of 12 go this way, okay? Two of 12 goes this way. Two three carbon molecules gives us the six carbon molecule of glucose. How many have we got left? We've got 10 of 12 go this way. So 10 of those three carbon molecules is 30 carbons going this way. And those 30 carbons, 10 three carbon molecules, are reshuffled and rearranged back into six five carbon molecules, which gives us 30 again. Okay, so 10 of the 12, 30 carbons regenerate the 30. So nothing is, so nothing is kind of wasted or, or runs out. It is a cyclical process that goes round and round and round as long as it is supplied with ATP from the light-dependent reaction here and here, and reduced NADP from the light-dependent reaction. So my highlighting there of, of the yellow things are products from the light-dependent reaction that are needed. Now, something about Rubisco, just a little bit of extra notes. It is not good, okay? Rubisco is, is pretty bad. It's a pretty bad enzyme. Um, is not very efficient. So let's kind of do this over here. Uh, it's not efficient. It's, it's a very old enzyme, evolutionary speaking. So it evolved so long ago that it evolved when basically there was a lot of carbon dioxide and not very much oxygen in the air. So it's not very specific. It can find oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, which leads to a process called, uh, let's change that a little bit. So that would lead to a process called photorespiration, uh, which is bad, okay? It's bad for the plant, it wastes a lot of carbon, and it's really bad. Uh, and it tends to happen more at high temperatures. Some plants have come up with a crafty way of kind of getting around this, um, and they're not really on the syllabus, but sometimes they're mentioned, and they're called C3 or is it C4? No, C4 or CAM plants. And they basically have evolved other mechanisms that we don't go into um, to kind of reduce the likelihood of this photorespiration. But because it's so inefficient, this enzyme, Rubisco, it is also 
very abundant, okay? It is the most abundant protein in the world. In the chloroplast, so much of the proteins knocking about in the stroma is Rubisco. So it is an important enzyme. Uh, it's not a great enzyme, but we, to make up for that, plants just pile loads of it in the stroma. Okay, so that's the Calvin cycle. Now, two things that relate to the Calvin cycle are what happens if we remove light. Okay, what happens if we turn off the lights? What happens to the Calvin cycle? Well, if, now you've got to think about this Calvin cycle as kind of like a roundabout, is the way I like to think about it. And if um, a car crashes on a roundabout, traffic will build up behind it. So what would happen if we were to remove the ATP here and the reduced NADP here? Both of these products are from the light-dependent reaction, and if they were to run out, what would happen? Well, GP here would build up and would not be able to be converted into triose phosphate. So that is what this graph shows. Here we have the light, and here we have turned out the light. Okay, we'll just call it dark. Now, if you turn out the lights, the, the level of GP increases, okay, because it's building up here. But the level of RUBP, which is this one, would go down still because RUBP can still bind to carbon dioxide and be converted into GP without any light or any energy or any external things apart from CO2. So this would be RUBP and in fact triose phosphate is, is the red one there. Okay, they would both kind of uh, decrease. The eagle-eyed amongst you will be like, okay, well how, how can triose phosphate here make it to there if there isn't any ATP? Well, there would be some ATP because there's always some ATP um, in plant cells because it's made in the mitochondria and without ATP, the cell would be dead. So there will be a teeny bit of ATP knocking around enough to drive this step, but crucially, there wouldn't be any reduced NAD to drive this step, okay? So this is the effect, um, if you wanna give this a title, effect of no light. A very similar graph, which actually has already been, I've already included labeled, would show us the effect of no CO2. Um, and in that case, we're just having the same kind of traffic jam, um, but at a different position. So, hmm, I'm gonna kind of link, I'm gonna make a little link here. So let's just say this is the, the traffic jam. I'm just going to kind of skip over here. Okay, so this shows what happens if you if you kind of block here because of no reduced NADP, you get this graph, and if you block here because of no CO2 present, you get this graph. Okay, so if there's no CO2 present, then we get a buildup of RUBP. There it is. Look, RUBP builds up, whereas the other two. Uh, the concentrations go down. Okay, so that's the effect of lack of light and lack of CO2 on the Calvin cycle. Those are both um, limiting factors. But we're gonna talk about limiting factors below, okay? See below. Okay, we're really uh, almost there. Let's talk about limiting factors. Here. So a limiting factor is anything, any factor, that can slow or limit the rate of photosynthesis. And we've got a few different ones. For example, uh, CO2 can limit the rate of photosynthesis. Light intensity can limit the rate of photosynthesis. And temperature. Now, water sort of could, but if there was a limiting amount of water in the plant cell, then the cell would be dead. So we don't normally say that, the, that water is limiting for photosynthesis. 
because it would be limiting for the life of the plant before. Okay, so in order to investigate limiting factors, we need to be able to measure the rate of photosynthesis. And to do so, we need to use a device called a photosynthetometer. Now, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, and this is already labeled. Um, but basically, what occurs is we use an aquatic plant. So this aquatic plant, Elodea, produces bubbles of gas from its stem. Uh, let me zoom in even further. And these bubbles of gas, I'm going to draw over this slightly, collect in a funnel here. And then we can, 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 we can draw the bubbles of gas up the capillary tube so that we're drawing air into the capillary tube. And then we wait a bit and we wait for some more bubbles to collect and we draw the bubbles up all the time, making sure that we don't draw water up in there. We just allow the bubbles and the air to be pulled in the capillary tube. And we keep repeating this process. We wait for some air to collect and we pull it in and we pull it in and we pull it in and we pull it in. So the air um, starts moving up the tube. Now we can time it. So maybe we, once we pull the bubble into this point here, level with the ruler, we start a timer. And then we wait maybe five minutes and we pull the bubble all the way through again. And now it's at this point. So let's say it's taken five minutes to move this distance. Okay, so maybe five minutes. The bubble has moved, let's say, 30 millimeters. So how much oxygen has been produced? Well, volume of oxygen produced equals pi r squared times L. So pi r squared, radius of the tube squared. The radius of a capillary tube would probably be something like a half a millimeter, maybe less. Um, and L is this length 30 millimeter, millimeters. That get, that's the formula for the volume of a, of a um, cylinder. And then we can work out the amount of oxygen produced in five minutes, which can give us a rate of photosynthesis. Okay. So the limiting factor graph that would, uh, that would result this would be rate of photosynthesis here. And it could all, and probably measured by the rate of oxygen production or other units, but possibly the rate of oxygen production. Uh, would look like this. Okay, so in, in condition A, we've got um, sort of atmospheric CO2 and 20, 20 degrees C. And over here, we've got atmospheric CO2 and 30 degrees C. So this actually shows us that under normal conditions, normal atmospheric conditions, 20 or 30 degrees, CO2 is limiting here. But then if we were to increase the CO2, which is what we've done here, now we can get a much higher rate of photosynthesis. So over here, um, actually some, this here we can tell because the temperature is 20 degrees C and if we increase it to 30 degrees C then we get even more photosynthesis. So up here temperature is limiting and remember the, the really important thing actually which I almost forgot to say is that whenever we're looking at a limiting factor graph, the thing on the x-axis is limiting when it's sloping up. So whatever is written here, this is limiting. If it's sloping. I'm not sure if that's how you spell sloping, but I'm going to leave it. So light intensity is limiting on the upwards part of the graph, and once it flattens off, some other factor is limiting. And those are how the factors work together. The very final thing, we're almost there, just shows here um, respiration plus photosynthesis and how they work together. 
Don't please forget that plants do photosynthesis, but they are also respiring. And plants respire 24-7, okay? So the rate of respiration is kind of constant, okay? So plants will always take in oxygen, okay? So this pink line here shows the oxygen uptake um, due to respiration. So this is the net usage of oxygen. And the blue and green lines show oxygen production. So the green line here would show oxygen production, and so would this one. The green line would be in a, uh, what's called a sun plant, or a plant that kind of loves full sun, and the, uh, the blue plant is a shade plant, so a plant that kind of prefers shadier um, environments. And what we can see from these graphs, again, let me zoom in a teeny bit more, is that there is a point in the day when actually the plant is not producing oxygen and it's not using oxygen. That's these points here where, where the graph, cross, where the, the blue line crosses the purple line, where the green line crosses the purple line. And this is called the uh, light compensation point. And at this point, exactly the rate of carbohydrate production is going to be zero. Okay? So there will be no net carbohydrate production. I shouldn't have said the rate is zero because there will be some being produced, but there will also be some being used up in respiration. So overall, uh, there would be none, uh, no net production. If you like maths, um, you can think about how much carbohydrate the plant makes during the day. And actually, uh, if you love maths, then you could think about that by sort of integrating underneath these lines. So the total amount of um, carbohydrate made by this green plant in the day is the area underneath the curve. Uh, this is not on the syllabus, so don't worry about it. And the total amount of um, carbohydrate burned in respiration is the area underneath the pink, pink line. So that's kind of, whoops, uh, it would be actually just kind of this rectangle here uh, that we would highlight. So therefore, you could say that because the yellow, the yellow area is bigger than the orange area, throughout the day, the plant is taking in more carbohydrate than it burns and is therefore growing. Okay, I think that is everything. Let's just zoom out and check I haven't missed anything. Yeah, that is it. That is everything to do with photosynthesis, module um, 5.6 from the OCI Level Biology Syllabus. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.